Good evening in church. God bless you all. Welcome to our Friday night Bible study for those of you that are streaming through. We're blessed church. Blessed to be here. It's a Friday night. A lot of people are obviously at home because they don't know where to go. And nothing to do, but we truly are blessed that every Friday and Sunday the house of God is still open. Praise God. So we just really want to give him the thanks tonight. Um, and as you know, most of you, last week was a powerful week. We had uh, the message shared by Archbishop the Underdog. It was a part two special as well on Friday and Sunday. And um, as Bishop said, you might be able to relate with that. You might feel like you're an underdog. Or you might feel like you're a top dog. Or you might just feel like you're a dog. <laughs> Either way, even the dogs eat from the uh, master's table. So we just want to I just want to read a couple of verses that Bishop shared from last week as well. And one's from Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up, up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock, and established my steps. He has put a new soul in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust. Praise God. That's what we want to do tonight and continually. So God bless you as we just prepare our hearts for worship and prepare our hearts for the message that's going to go out and power to us. God bless you, church. So I hand over to the praise team.
hand for free. God bless you. Welcome to those that have uh, maybe come here for the first time, and those that are tuning in for the first time, you're more than welcome into the house of God this evening. Let's take our seats. We're going to take our offering. And that's a very important part of our worship that we do week in, week out. And there's a real significance and a real importance that this is just a simple act that we can do to really give unto God and to really show God how much we appreciate everything that he does for us on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. So we're going to take our offering uh, this evening. Deacon Andrew will put the basket in front of us normal, so you can give, and you'll be called up row, row by row. And those at home, you're included as well, and your details will be coming up on the screen to give your offering. So everything we do, we give unto God, and in respect of whether God gives back to us or not, we still give and we still praise and we still serve Him anyway. So be blessed as you give this evening. God bless.
for God to do something new in our lives. We want to encourage you to press through the crowd of distractions because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But praise be to God that he said, but I have come to give you life. Let's live our best life. And let's travel the journey well. We know that we're on a journey. And we know that heaven and earth is going to pass away. But while we're traveling, let's travel it well. Praise God. And that means loving each other. That means forgiving one another. That means preferring one another. Travel it well. That means allowing the Holy Spirit to look into the depth of our hearts. And to take out those weeds. That's troubling it well. Allowing him full access into every aspect of our lives. Not just what people see. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one's noticing. When no one's looking. But God is looking. And like Archbishop says many times, we can fool people. Some of the time, all of the time, whatever the saying is, but we can't fool God. So tonight as a church, as we come before the word of God. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do something new in us. And if he wants to delve into crevices and corners of our heart, don't harden ourselves. Let's not be a stiff-necked people. Relax in the presence of God because he loves you with an everlasting love. And his mercy and his grace flows. Relax in the presence of God. But if there's conviction, receive it. If there's instructions, allow it. Allow the word to be ministered because Archbishop has a word from the throne room, but we can block that word or we can receive it and invite it. Invite the spirit tonight. Allow him to come into this place and into the depth of our heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as your children, we come before you in sincerity and truth. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to have your way in and through our lives. And as your word is ministered, we pray that it may find good soil, that we may rest at your feet, that we may choose the best places Mary chose to hear these precious words from your throne room. And we thank you for Archbishop's life continually. I thank you, Father God, that you lead and you guide and unite us together as a church. And we say, Lord, have your way. We pray for our children for the word and for the offering. We thank you that we have known you all of our lives as Yahweh Jireh, the God who provides, the God who sees and provides. And tonight I thank you, God, that you are the God who sees and that you are the God who hears our prayer. And we give you the preeminence tonight and the glory in Jesus' name. Let's give a little clap off as Archbishop comes to show you. you you can give each other a wave acknowledgement turn around look to your front to your back and just say hello welcome we've survived another week praise god we're moving onwards and upwards anyone visiting the first time as uh, deacon dom shared you are welcome it's a special time that we will look forward we're looking forward to how things will unfold for the rest of the year but we're still ahead amen we're not beneath, but from above, and we're not the tail where they head, as the scripture tells us. So God bless you. It's good to be here. There was a number of birthdays today. It was a blessing to have my grandson Christian here with us tonight. He's 13 this week. And he decided to celebrate his birthday by coming to church. And then, so it's wonderful. Everyone's all celebrating their birthdays. And then he have returns over there. I know that we have our dear beloved Pastor Julian. He's 50 years old yesterday. So from 13, Christian, to 50, we're celebrating with God is in the house of God bless you. Happy birthday. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just a year older when Jesus went into the temple to amaze the, the doctor's scholars. He was 12 years old and Christian's 13. So I pray you this will be the beginning of a new chapter. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful. God bless. Amen. Tonight's message, uh, the theme for tonight's message is, I said, you are God's. Interesting statement. I said you are God's. It's powerful because people are a bit nervous about saying I can identify with God, I can be God-like. People don't see it in those terms, they think it's an arrogance, it's conceitedness, it's proud. 
where it's complete opposite. If you know you have a relationship with God, you have a confidence about you. Yeah. Whatever comes your way, you know will be deflected. Yeah. You know you're Satan proof. You know there's a shield around you, there's a hedge. Uh, the Bible says there's an angel uh, guards his people, praise God, puts a shield around us, a hedge around us. And I want just to read this, just one verse, draw, rip this verse out from the Gospel of John chapter 10. I want to rip this Gospel, this verse 34 from the Gospel of John chapter 10 as a foundation for tonight's message to take us on a journey. And I pray that we'll be encouraged and we get to a divine destination. This is John 10, 34, it says, Jesus answered. I wanted to put in the context in a little while, but I just want to draw this out and just put it out there for you to think about what the Lord himself is saying. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. So it's a statement, Jesus himself speaks to the creation, to the people around him and the accusers around him. And the reason they were accusing him, they were accusing him of blasphemy because he identified with God, taking him to the place of making him equal with God and making himself God. Because he said, God is my father. They knew the implications of what it meant to say, God is my father. We say it lightly, we say it casually. We have a blasé attitude when we say, our father who hearts in heaven. But when the devil hears that you call God your father, he trembles, he's tormented. Amen. Amen. When the devil knows, acknowledges that you know who you are, he's fearful because he knows he has lost the battle. Yes. Amen. Because when you know who you are, Amen. things move, things, strongholds come tumbling down. Amen. Jesus said, is it not written in your law that you are God's? Amen. And I want you to explore this. This statement Jesus makes, because the, 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 the reference to this, the source of this is Psalm, the English Psalm is Psalm 82, in fact the Greek is Psalm 81, but let me go to the English and I'll, I'll scroll down to the Greek. Psalm 82 verse 6, watch this, it says this, I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. It says, Now the English actually doesn't translate it correctly. In fact, the, 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 the English says, and all of you are children. In fact, the, the Hebrew and the Greek say, you are sons of God. Implying the implication, we come under the sonship of Jesus Christ. Whether gender, whatever gender you are, when you come to God, you acknowledge under the, under the authority, under the mantle of Jesus Christ. You come under the sonship of Jesus Christ before the Father. I wish I was speaking to and, and so the Greek says, Ye theo, ipsis, the, the, the sons of the Most High. The Hebrew says, Ven, which means son. He says, he says, you are Elohim. He says, and you are sons of the Most High. You are sons, not children, but sons of the Most High. But then watch how, how it unfolds. Watch this in verse 7. It says this. But you should die like men and fall like one of the princes. So he says, you are sons of the Most High, he says. Did I not say you are gods and sons of the Most High? And, and he goes on to say, but you should die like men. He makes, he differentiates between two natures here. He puts the sons of God up against, compares and contrasts with men, the sons and children of men. The Hebrew word for son is ven. The Hebrew word for men is adam. Because Adam was the father of fallen humanity. And there was a pure lineage. What when I say pure, a lineage that still recognized God. Sorry, I hope I'm not going too deep for people who've come for the first time. I just want to just bring you to the depth, width, and the height of the word of God to encourage you within the word. So at the beginning, when Adam fell and transgressed, transgressed and disobeyed God, he was cast out of the presence of God and his nature was impacted, affected. But of his offspring, there was one lineage that embraced and still acknowledged the true and living God. And that was the lineage of Seth, who was the third son of Adam. Because Cain killed Adam, which, which sorry, Cain killed Abel, which Abel was the one that God accepted his offering. And Cain, he rejected, not because what he gave them, but the attitude that they gave the offering. God accepted Abel and rejected Cain. Because that's, God doesn't care whether you give him a million pounds or a penny. It's how you give it that counts to God. Amen. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Because the woman with the two mites gave more in the treasury than everyone who had all the riches that they were given because of their abundance. But she gave everything that she had from the attitude of love and sacrifice. Hallelujah. 
If you're just giving your leftovers to God, you're not giving anything to God. Amen. It somehow has to be painful in a sense to know you're really, sacrifice implies a type of pain. Amen. A type of let, letting go. Amen. And if you're just giving just the scraps to God, forget about it. God doesn't need your scraps to exist on. He's an authority unto himself. And so the pure lineage was said. And it's the sons of God are from the Hebrew people that are identified with the lineage of Seth. And the men was the, the, the humanity at general. But God, God's intention and God's plan was for you and I to share the divine nature, to be God's by grace. So today, my dear brethren and friends, we stand between two poles. In fact, we stand between the east and the west. And, and, I, and amazingly, that when we purchased this building, we didn't know the dimensions of this building, that you enter from the east, and this is the west. We didn't know that that was the north and that was the south. We just bought a building. But we're standing at the west, the advantage place of relation with God, because it's in the west that God reveals himself to you. And I want to explain this to the people, to you and people watching live stream at home, what I mean by this. We stand between two poles. You see, between being sons of God and children of men. We need to or identify with humanity, the fallen nature. We need to decide of, on which side of the fence we want to stand. And when I say decide, it means we have a choice because we have free will. God will not force you into any side of a fence. You may want to set, fence it, but in reality, according to the word of God, there are no fence sitters. A non-decision is a decision of the opposite negating being with God. I wish I'm speaking to someone. That's what it's saying. So either if you're not consciously with God, you are unconsciously against God. If you're not consciously, in a conscious way, in the presence and embracing the, the principles and statutes of God, you're embracing everything which is the antithesis of what is represented in God. Oh. You see, when Abraham, when Abraham, before he becomes Abraham, God called him to leave his father's house, his country, and his family, yeah? In, in Genesis chapter 12, watch this, watch this. I want, I want to just qualify this because it's important because we're standing between two poles and we have to make a decision in life, yeah? You can't be in two camps at the same time. In Genesis 12 verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. He says, leave, leave, your, leave everything behind. You have to cut the, 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 the emotional cord strings from what holds you back to be where I want you to be. And on the journey, we're told that, a, that Abraham camped in a specific place. And he identifies the place where Abraham, Abraham camped with Sarah and Lot, his, his brother's son. Watch this. In verse 8, this is, watch this carefully, it says this. And he moved from the mountain, uh, he moved to, and he moved there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord, this is Yahweh, and called on the name of the Lord. This is, okay. So what does he do? He's between two poles. He pitches his tent with, with Bethel on the west. Here, and... And I, on the east, on the other side, completely opposite, between two poles. And that's a representation of the human condition before we come to the re realization of the invitation that God loves us and he wants us to leave the past behind. Amen. Yeah. And so we stand between two poles to make a decision. And we need to make the decision because Bethel means the presence of God and the, the word Bethel means house of God. The word I means rubbish. We're standing between rubbish and Bethel. Watch geographically where they are identified, with geographically where they are. Bethel is on the west. I is on the east. The journey of the Israelites to get to the promise of God and coming to, to conquest the land of Canaan, they had to come from the east and go to the west. The east represents the old man, the west represents the new man. The east represents death, the west represents life. So, so we have to make, so Abraham though pitches his tent and, he, and God's inviting him to the west,
But sometimes he goes on a detour to get to where God wants him to be. And that's what we do sometimes. God's invited us to be somewhere, but we, we get distracted. We, we come off through. We take a detour thinking there's a shortcut, and that shortcut becomes a long way. <laughs> And the Israelites thought it was a shortcut to Canaan, and they ended up 40 years in the wilderness. And why were they 40 years in the wilderness? Because they were in the wilderness for 40 years so that the people who did not believe and trust God would die in the wilderness. That represent the old mindset, the old ways. The old generation died, and it was the new generation that crossed from the east to the west. Because we've got to come to God in a new way, as a new man, as a new creation. Amen. And I want to qualify this before, before we move on to, uh, to come to the conclusion of the message today, which is Joshua chapter 5, verse 6 to verse 8. It says this, watch this. We're told this, Joshua 5, verse 6. It says, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. Can you imagine that? And why were they walking 40 years in the wilderness? Because 10 of the tribes did not believe that they can enter, enter the promise of God. They had disbelief. They were dwarfed in the face of the giants of Canaan. They said, we are like grasshoppers in their presence, in their sight. They'll consume us, they'll destroy us. We cannot fight against them. But God didn't tell them to go to Canaan and fight, fight the giants. He said, watch and see, I will fight for you. He says, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring the victory for you. You don't have to do it. Just stand still and see my salvation. And what we do, we fight and we struggle with things that are not for us to fight for. We just need to pray to God. And when God moves, all things are possible unto those who believe. So because of these centuries, all the rest of them had to wander for 40 years. It's, has it ever happened to you that you've been a victim of somebody else's mistake? Or somebody else's is wrong. You, you, you've been affected by somebody else's actions. Can you imagine the only two witnesses who gave a positive report were Joshua and Caleb. And by virtue of the ten outnumbered the two, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And notice Caleb and Joshua had to also walk the, the, the wilderness for 40 years because of the other people's mistake. And sometimes we, we pay the price for other people's errors and wrongdoings. But they did it humbly, willingly, because they believe it will come to pass. Amen. Though it tarry, it will come to pass. Amen. Though it take a long time, it will come to pass. Amen. The man was 30 years, 38 years paralyzed by the pool in Bethlehem, sorry, in Jerusalem. And after 38 years, God intervened in his life and he received his healing. It was 38 years, but it came at the right time. So however long you've been waiting for your breakthrough, let me tell you, your breakthrough will come if you look in the right direction and you see the salvation of the Lord. It says it's for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were with men of, who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, who consumed, uh, were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. So they wandered 40 years for God to, to sift out all the negativity, to sift out all the doubters. You know when the Lord went into Jairus' house? Can I just have a bit of power so I'm not screaming, please? Just a bit of power so I can tone the voice down. He went to Jairus' house, and there were people, a number of people in the, in the room, and they were all negative. They doubted. They said, the girl is dead. Don't travel with the master anymore, Jesus anymore. And what did he do? Everyone who did not believe, he, he put them out of the room. Because sometimes you need to get rid of some negativity so you can look through the eyes of positivity. He had to ask them to leave before he called uh, Jairus' daughter to rise. And sometimes things need to come out of our lives so we can see clearly ahead and see the reality of what's going on. We have too much noise sometimes around our lives that distracts us. It, 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 it deafens us. We cannot hear the truth for all the negativity voices around our lives. So the Lord allowed them to, he took them through the wilderness for 40 years to sift them out, to remove all the negative, all the blockages, all the doubts. And those men of war may represent thoughts in our minds. We may have thoughts that God wants to get rid of. And sometimes it takes us through a process. And sometimes that process is not comfortable. But it takes us through that process to refine us, that we can see clearly, to deal with ourselves, to challenge our inner man, 
to, to, to actually come to a point that we have, God has got our attention, which is amazing. Watch this. Were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their, to their fathers that he would give us, a land flung with milk and honey. And verse, the next verse very quickly. Verse 8. Can we go to verse, verse, verse? So it was when they had finished circumcision, all the people that, that stayed in their places in the camp till they were, so stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. And so God's taken us through a process. And he brings, let me just go to verse 7 because I think we missed that verse 7 very quickly. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place. And circumcision piece means about cutting something out. There's a circumcision of the flesh the Abrahamic circumcision. But there's a greater circumcision for the New Testament church. And the greater circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. That you take everything that distracts you, every negative thing, everything that you, you're entangled with, you cut it away, that you can move freely onwards and forwards in following the leading of the Lord. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And sometimes God takes, and sometimes circumcision is painful. And there needs to be a healing process connected to being circumcised. When God deals with the inner man, sometimes he, we, he needs to bring healing in our lives. When, when God cuts things off from the past, sometimes we, we romanticize. And we self-afflict ourselves because we think we're be it was better where we came from. But God's got something greater for you that lies ahead. They were romanticizing about Egypt. But God had Canaan, had milk and honey, had his promises, had his blessings, had his anointing, had his sanctification lying ahead of them. But they were looking in the past and God had to sever that by the circumcision to cut them off. Cut off the cords that held them back in slavery in Egypt. Oh. And that's what's going This is a process, God. And this is a metaphor. This is a spiritual metaphor saying the journey we go through in ourselves. Some things need to sever, need to be cut off. And not look, keep looking back. We need to look ahead. And see where the Lord is leading us. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, the Israelites all the time reminded Moses, look, we had so much in Egypt. And he took, where does, where does Joshua take them when he takes over from, from, from Moses? He takes them to the Jordan. And the Jordan, as I've told you often time, was the most murkiest, dirtiest, polluted river of its day. He takes them to a place to remind them of filth. To remind them of their past, where they were coming from. And that was a, there was a river of filth ahead of them. But the Lord says to them, you need to cross over this filth, this stench. This pollution, you need to cross over. Because what's on the other side is better from where you've come from. Amen. You sometimes have got to go through some rubbish to come out clean. Amen. Welcome your, your grace, your Bishop Wesley, your first lady, Bishop. Uh, no, thank you. Lovely to see you. Let's see, it wouldn't be better than that. Let's welcome you. God bless you. They had to travel all the way from Kent, so it's a long journey. So it's a pleasure to have you here today with us. God bless you. Amen. So... Sometimes when God takes us through the journey, we encounter things that challenge us, that bring us pain. But God gives us a process. He helps. He's the true healer. He says, I've not come for those who are well. I've come for the sick. And he brings healing into people's lives. You're, you're on your journey. You are standing between two poles tonight. Humanity always stands between two poles. It stands between air, I, and Bethel. The same way as Abraham did when he left his country, his family, his father's house. Stand between the two poles. I means rubbish and Bethel means house of God. You stand between two poles. We stand between identifying with being sons of God and being sons of men. It's a challenge. We need to make a decision. Where are we going to put our allegiance with? Where, who are we going to be connected with? We need to decide whether we want to be part of the rubbish of the world, the I, or we want to be where the treasure of God is and the house of God is. Amen. But you cannot have both. You cannot have your foot in both camps. Amen. You cannot sit on the fence. You've got to make a decision. Where are you going to be? And if you don't make a decision, guess what? You are in the rubbish. You are in the negative, which contradicts the positive. I wish I'm speaking to someone. We're standing between to the two poles of the sons of God and the sons of men. The sons of Adam and the sons of Elohim. We're standing between those two amazing poles. 
And Paul teaches us how we can become sons of God. When I'm speaking about sons of God, I'm talking about not talking about gender. I'm speaking about covering under the covering of Jesus Christ. Paul teaches us clearly the way to become a son of God, to identify with, with God divinity, not humanity, not the flesh, the carnality, but divinity, praise God. And this is what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Watch this. He says this, for you are all sons of God. How? Through faith. It's your faith in Christ Jesus that qualifies you to be a son of God. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Because the Pharisees say, we're the sons of Abraham. You're not son of Abraham by your physical descendancy. You're son of Abraham by your faith in God. Amen. And according to Psalm 82, those who identify with men fall like the princes. So if you're not in with God, you're setting yourself up for a big fall. It's God who preserves us. God who sustains us. God who lifts us up. God who fights the battles for us. Amen. On every, every, every step and every milestone of, of the life of Israel, every victory they had, it wasn't by virtue of their might. It wasn't by virtue of their power. It was by virtue of God's intervention that dealt with the enemy, the adversary that came against them. I wish I'm speaking to someone. It wasn't, they didn't do it in their own natural self. It was God's intervention that changes everything, praise God. What I said, you are God. The subject today, your grace is, is, uh, is I said you are sons of God. People are, are nervous to think in those terms. What does it mean, you are sons of God? Psalm 82, verse 6 says, I said you are sons of God, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you should die like men, and fall like one of the princes. I was having a discussion this week with a dear beloved sister, loving sister, I often speak at their church, and I spoke after last Sunday service, I spoke through the Skype, I gave a message on their church website to their congregation, it was lovely. And we were asking the question, who are the sons of God? Because there's so many different views and ideas and interpretations of Genesis chapter 6. Some say in Genesis chapter 6, I will just go through it very quick because we'll just compare and contrast the sons of God to the sons of men. It says this, I want to put it out there and just I've got to move on to the message, just to food for thought for you tonight. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 1, watch what it, watch what's said here. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply, it says uh, uh, on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, verse 2 says, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all of all whom they chose. And verse 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days should be 120 years. Prior to this, people were living for hundreds of years. Pre-flood, people were living for many years. Post-flood, People, lifespan was shortened. This is, that's what, according to scripture, we know that people live, could live up to 120 people. I know people have lived uh, quite long lives, but that's what the Bible is teaching us. And the thing is, the question that people are asking and trying to explain this passage, quite a difficult passage uh, uh, theologically to explain, because there's many schools of thought. And some even of the early church, and even the, the, the Jewish interpreters at the time of, of the turn of, the time from Christ, B.C. to A.D., were looking at this in a particular way. They were looking at these sons of God and saying, these are, oh yeah, sons of God. They were saying, if we go back to verse 1 and 2 very quickly, just, just for, I'm just dropping this out. This is a Bible study, so you don't mind me exploring this just very quickly, because I was asking this debate, discussing this last week. Now, it came to pass, and it says that, that when men here, uh, let me just go to the, right up to the Hebrew, please, very quickly. I just want to see the Hebrew. Yeah, it says, Ha-Adam. Ha-Adam uh, ha means mankind. So Adam, Ha-Adam. So man. So we're talking about man. So because when you do biblical exegesis, you need to understand the language. It's primary language. And to interpret the Bible, you need the Bible itself to interpret the Bible. You cannot have other books to interpret the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit is the tool you need Amen. to understand the Bible. Amen. And it's all coded, and it's the Holy Spirit that decodes the Bible. Watch this. That's why I look at the Greek, Hebrew, and English. And so, in verse 2, it says this. Watch this very carefully. It says, Then the sons of God saw the daughters of men. 
the Hebrews, the Greek says this, even this they ye to fill. They saw the sons of men, ye sons, to fill of God. So the daughters of men. So the sons of God, okay, so the daughters of men, the daughters of Adam. What's the distinction there? The one. So you have the sons of God, you have the daughters of men, the daughters of Adam. And the question was asked to me, who are the sons of God? And I said, well, because there's a teaching that says his angels came and had relation with the, the sons, the daughters of men, and have offspring, and those offspring were called Nephilim, which were the giants. And when the giants died, they say they became demons. And things like this. I'm not, I'm not here to take any side at the moment. I'm not saying this. I'm just telling you what the, the... But when I look at Psalm 82, and I compare and I contrast these two passages... And then I look at other portions of scripture, it puts a different facet on what he's speaking about the sons of God. Because God made a distinction between the humanity. The distinction he made was he set his people aside and used a particular word to identify his people in the scripture as olaos. It's called God's people in the scripture, the Greek translations, which the Bible, the Old Testament was translated to Greek and the apostles were quoting from the Greek they used the Greek word laos to represent God's people and he contrasted and put it up against the ethne which meant the sons of Adam. Okay, watch this, watch this. So when we come to Psalm 82, where I was reading just earlier, we just got back there very quickly, 8 verse 6, says this. I said you are gods. Okay, who is he speaking to? Jesus clearly tells us in John chapter 10, verse 34, he says that this is directed to God's people through Moses, through the scripture, watch this, who the law came from. Watch this. Jesus answered, said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God. He's speaking to his people, that his people, God looked at them as God. They were, God's intention was to make you in his image and his likeness to share divine nature by grace, not by nature. Watch this, watch this. He said, I said to our God. So come back to Psalm 80, 82, verse 6. Watch this. He says, I said you are gods. So he's saying to his people, I made you God. That's why Jesus says, there's not a problem for, my, for I to say I am the son of God. Because God's desire is for all of us to be sons and children of God. Okay, watch this. And then he says this. This is in Psalm 82, verse 6. And you are all children of the Most High. The Hebrew is ven, which means sons. Genesis chapter 6, it says, ven Elohim, sons of God. In Psalm 82, referring to his people, he calls them ven Elohim, sons of God, sons of the Most High. So really, what are these sons is alluding to, these sons here? Well, in the Gospel of Luke, we know who the sons of God, God's intention, who his son should be. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, watch this. It said this. And the son of Enos, the son of Seth, and the son of Adam, the son of... And so these sons were the line of Seth that was becoming corrupted. And by virtue of this corrupted, God moved and acted against Seth, the lineage being contaminated, never to be reprieved, never to, to, be, to, to move on, to overcome. So he destroyed to give another opportunity for the lineage to carry on. Anyway, that's a different message for another time. I said you are gods. To, to call God your father implies that you have his spiritual DNA. Okay? We have to have something that identifies with him to call yourself a father. Every creature in creation has an offspring and its offspring must share in the nature of, of the parent. If you have a cat, it has to have a kit and it has to have the cat's identity, uh, nature. If you have a horse, it has to have the horse nature. If a fish has to have the fish nature. Every creature shares, is, has a common connection to the source of what defines what it is. I wish I'm speaking to someone. So for Jesus to say, my father, and call God his father, he must have something that identifies a nature, a trait that connects to divinity. And that's what offended them. 
Okay? But it's God's desire continually that we re be restored. This is not something new happening. This is coming back to where we should have been in the first place. Amen. It's like you're a king, you leave your palace, you become a, port a pauper, but really your identity as a king, and it's, you have to get back to your palace to restore your kingship. Amen. And this is what Jesus did. He came to bring us back to the palace to restore us from the place we had fallen. The prodigal son was in the far country, but he was still the son of the father. But he had to get back to the father and a change had to take place to realize his true identity as a son and not a servant. I wish I'm speaking to someone. And it's a journey back that God is concerned with. And this is why Jesus came to be the signpost to point back to where we were before we had fallen. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So we have the right in, in our spiritual selves, in our connection through Jesus Christ being Son, to call God Father. This is what Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. He says this, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You received the Holy Spirit so you can have the element of divinity restoring you back to where you were before we had fallen through Adam. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, and, and Peter says this, who was a close disciple of Jesus Christ? He was, the, he was the spokesperson for the apostles. He was the full guy. He always ran ahead. His mouth ran before his head, his brain. He went to walk on the water. He began to sink. He said, Lord, help me. And God put him back on the boat, put him back to the shore. And at the conclusion of the matter, at the end of that journey, the conclusion he comes to is this, and I want to qualify this. I want to read this to you very quickly in relation to I said you are God's. Right, watch this. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says this. As, verse 3, 2 Peter 1 verse 3. As his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Please follow this carefully. Just take your time. As his divine power has given, us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which having been given, given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be, watch, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. Amen. Praise God. By which, verse 4, have given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. Absorbing divinity in our humanity, transforming us. He became man that we can share in his divinity. People shy away from this because to say you have a divine element in your being is a great responsibility. And you are greatly, you have a great accountability, most importantly to your Father in Heaven. It's not that you're perfect, children make mistakes, but we have the opportunity to rise above this and walk on the waves of life's challenges and, 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 and turbulence if we trust in God. Amen. I wish I was speaking to someone. Thank you. Uh, so, but, verse 5, but also for this re very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you have these virtues flowing through your being, you'll be fruitful. Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. He's called us to go and bear fruits worthy for the kingdom. And the only way we can bear these fruits, if we are connected to divinity and we draw from the source of divinity, the Pharisees, he challenges you are of your father who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So all, what you, you, you cannot build, you can only destroy. Yeah? You cannot build, you can only destroy. You don't need any qualification to destroy. No qualification needed. Come, smash the place up. You want to build it? It takes effort. You want to destroy it? Just bring your sledgehammer. And that's what people do. Because they cannot build, they want to destroy other people's efforts and other people's lives and other people, other people are doing. Because they cannot build, they won't make the effort. 
They want to destroy everyone else. But God's called us to be builders, to build with him, to be co-workers with him. And unless he build the house, those who labor, labor in vain, the Bible tells us. So today, we need to celebrate our divinity. We need to celebrate that we are children of the Most High. I said you are God. You are sons of the Most High. You need to celebrate who died God. But we must not, we must not die like men, like Adam, and fall like one of the princes. The princes are demonic powers. Lucifer was a cherubim, an archangel, a, a, a top rank angel. And he fell through pride, through arrogance. Yeah? So he says, he says, we die like men and we fall like the princes. We need to rise up and celebrate our divinity. And move, move on and become all that God wants us to be. Amen. In the same way, watch this. We shared the first Adam's identity. That's Adam in the garden, Adam and Eve. When I say Adam, I'm talking about the first humans, Adam and Eve. We shared, now we need to embrace the second Adam's identity, which is Jesus Christ. Paul tells us this, please follow with me. I know I might be going above some people's heads and even people watching live stream, but I just want, I want to take you deep into the word of God because deep calls unto deep. Watch this, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Watch this. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Watch this. However, he says this, the spiritual is not first, the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. Abraham blessed his, father, blessed his father's house, his country, and his family, and went on a journey. He becomes Abraham, as I said, the, uh, former weeks. And, and on that journey, change takes place. He started one way, he ended up somewhere completely different. But he had to obey God, and it was counted as righteousness to him, and he was called a friend of God. You want to be a friend of God? Obey God. You want to be a friend of God? Believe God. If you want to be a friend of God, trust God. If you want to be a friend of God, obey God. Amen. It's not rocket science. Yeah, and so Paul tells us that the last Adam became a life giving spirit. However, watch this what he says this. We have a choice where we say, we can stay with the old man. We can stay with the old Adam. And the old Adam is represented in the dust of the earth because that's where God took him from. And by representing the dust of the earth, the devil has rights over the dust of the earth because that's the, the, the domain that God gave as a punishment to the devil. He will crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. So the demonic powers have authority over the dust, but they don't have that authority over the second and last Adam, which is Adam in the spiritual realm. Yeah. I wish I'm speaking to him. Yes, sir. Watch this. It says, however, the spiritual is not first. Yes, you were born in the world. That's why Nicodemus had to be born again. Because he had to disconnect with the Adam, the old man. He had to become the new man in Christ. Amen. Watch, 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 watch. However, it says this, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first Adam was of the earth, made of dust. The second Adam is the Lord from heaven. Watch this. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we should also bear the image of the, of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit in corruption. He says flesh and blood. He says, well, he says, I said you are gods and sons of the most high. But you die like men and fall like one of the princes. God's desire is to restore us. Restoration in the biblical truth, biblical sense, is not restoration by filling your bank account, by giving you material things. The restoration God speaks about is restoration of body, soul, and spirit. It's a spiritual restoration. Everything else is the byproduct of that. The most important thing is being restored in Christ Jesus. And that's the purpose. That's the mission came to Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, to give us opportunity to be restored back and to him. I wish I was speaking to someone tonight. And this is what we stand in. We stand between two poles here. And as I said, between the natural and the spiritual, between I and Bethel, between the sons of God and the, the sons of, of, of man. Uh, it's up, we make that choice. We stand between the first Adam and the last Adam. We make that choice. But don't fence it because God wants to restore you. 
And hence, I want to close the last few thoughts for you to think about as you leave this evening. I want to go to Joel chapter 2 verse 25. And this is what restoration entails, represents and means. The restoration God gives you is not partial. It's not just a, a, a small part of yourself. It's whole restoration, body, soul, and spirit. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 says this. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I, I set among you. You shall eat in, eat in plenty and be satisfied. There's fourfold restoration. We're told swarming locusts, crawling locusts, consuming locusts, and chewing locusts is body, soul, spirit. Every element, every aspect of your being, God wants to restore. Amen. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Be prayerful, be reflective. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And whatever's happening around us, let's not detour, let's not be distracted and look to him that he can restore us from the depth of our heart, crown of our head and every aspect of our being. Let's stand together, praise Amen. God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us become Christ-like. Amen. Before I come into prayer, let's just ask the praise and just to lift us one one praise song. I want an uplifted song. I know who I am. Can we lift that? Yeah, and if you want to dance, feel free to dance. If you want to sing, feel free to sing. But celebrate your your freedom in Christ. Celebrate the love of God. And he who started this great work in us is more than able to bring it to fruition. Has someone put oil this evening? Who's put this? Is this this oil? No. I'm Maria. Okay. Thank you. I will, will, will pray, consecrate. I know who I am, but I want to have to be faster. Wake up. <laughs> we are the chosen generation. Call up to show his excellence. Surely goodness and mercy should follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 God bless you. You are loved. We're here Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. So as through the guidelines, you'll be directed how to leave the building in a safe 